people that might watch this what a typical day at gold mountain was like yeah because it was it was just such an astounding time of course the boards went up at 340 i was the one that usually hit the board yep i remember then we, then we were in the you know doing the morning recitation at four and if you weren't in the hall uh we would i would go and i'd slip the bed over you know, <laughs> oh, it wasn't that gently. I, I slipped the bed and dumped the person on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody made it into the hall. And uh, then, of course, we had the one hour of relaxed meditation where you could knock off if you wanted to. And then an hour of if you knock, knocked off, you'd get whacked, you know. And then everybody would go off and do whatever they wanted to do till the meal offering, you know, whatever their chores were. And sometimes there were lessons in between, you know, or classes, Chinese. And then we'd have lunch, you know. Yep. And uh, the lunch was always open to anyone that was there. Yep. As was the morning morning recitation and the chan, the sitting. People come in on off of the street, go into the chan hall and sit in chan. And people did that. And sometimes if even though it was early in the morning, they'd come to the morning recitation. Mm -hmm. So there was like this incredible degree of enthusiasm. I myself, when I first arrived at Gold Mountain, I didn't have a clue. I left from San Francisco Zen Center after coming from India, and they directed me there because they said, you know, you can't cultivate here because you just do, you know, you're doing eight, eight hours and you're just, you got to go somewhere else. And they said, the only place we know is a place where it's so strict, nobody can stay there. Yeah. They sent me over to Gold Mountain. Yeah. But when I arrived at Gold Mountain, I just said, I, I'd just like to see the hall. And Hung Ju opened the door. Okay. And I, and I said, can I look at the Buddha hall? And he said, yeah. And, I, and then, I, of course, I saw Su Yun's photo on the wall and the master's photo on the wall. I looked at Su Yun. I said, is this the master that's here? If it is, I'm going to stay. And they said, no, but <laughs> because he passed away. But the one next to it is the one, one next here. To yeah, but he won't be back. He won't be here for three months because he's traveling. Oh, was he in Brazil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I arrived too. Okay, so well, what happened was I said, "This is what was so shocking to me because if somebody tells me somebody's not at the temple even that day, I leave." Huh. Know, but this was three months, and I, without even thinking about it, I said, "Okay, can I stay for until he's here?" I was shocked, and Hungry said, yeah, just stay, you know. That's good. So there was no, you know, application form or, you know, what's your background? What do you want to stay for? They said, yeah, you want to cultivate? Come on in. So from that yeah. day on, I was at Gold Mountain, you know, three and a half years, and then came up here for seven. So the point of that is that what happened with Hung Ju, that conversation was Hung Ju was a policy at Gold Mountain for anybody that showed up on the street, you want to cultivate, we'll feed you, we'll house you, and we'll be asked, answer any of your questions. You can meditate all you want. You can study. We'll teach you a language if you want to learn a language. Yeah. No questions asked, you know. If your heart was sincere and in the right place, you could stay. Mm. There wasn't anything beyond that, you know. So... And it was tough, but the incredible thing about Gold Mountain was it was tough, 
And the harder it got, the more enthusiasm we all had. Right. You know? That's right. But because we all felt the, you know, of course, the master at Gold Mountain, we were so lucky. When after I came back after years, people told me, you know, you know, you and I, we and all the people at Gold Mountain, the master would come down, sit and chon with us. He would, you know, come into the kitchen when you're washing dishes and talk to you, you know, and, you know, it was personal contact, you know, with, with, with the master. Right. So, and then, but that did it, but all the personal contact usually, you know, was like walking on eggshells because wherever there was personal contact, it was like, oh, you're, you're suddenly stripped of all your, your, your clothes and there you are, the master's seeing right through you. He was seeing right through you. He was reading your mind. Yeah. And often he, often I know for myself and others, Surfer would make a remark, like when he'd come into the kitchen or when I was sitting, Sean, and I, I would thought, well, what the heck was he talking about? Hmm. And then maybe two weeks later, oh, <laughs> that's ding, <what>? yeah. <laughs> ding dong. Yeah. So after lunch, we all, you know, we had different projects. Everybody was working on super translation. I was running the Chan Hall. People were in the office. You remember the sign that went up that this office is bugged? Do you remember that? Oh, really? Oh, I forgot that. Yeah, that's because, right. Because every time that somebody in the there was always two or three in the office answering phones and people would come in from the street and the any time that something got off track, you know, not really particularly to the functioning of the monastery, distribution of books, running a charm session, organizing the meals for the next day. <laughs> and one time when I repented, I don't know if you were there for that repentance, but I, my father and his girlfriend, two girlfriends came at the same time. I think I, think I helped translate for that meeting. Well, you know what? So I I decided, well, I don't want to talk in front of my father, but I'm going to, you know, because it was the worst time he's there with visiting. Is. So I, yeah. gave this re- I gave this repentance, and the next day, Serpu came up to me and he says, repentance is a good thing, but you don't have to lose your existence. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, so he's... Huh. You know, okay. So there was all of these, sometimes, you know, like... Richard, hold on. He said, he said, repentance is good, but you don't have to lose your existence, he said? He said, re- he says, it's great that you repented, but you don't have to lose your existence. You know, like, you, over, you don't have to, you know. Do it. You know, over. That's interesting, yeah. Now, yeah. You, you, you repented when your dad was there, is that right? Yeah. Your dad heard it. Yeah, I remember that. That, that really impressed me. And I, I was helping translate. And I remember uh, Sherfu what I saw was the fact that he was your father when he was in front of Sherfu didn't matter. Sherfu was talking, he was teaching him directly. You know, he was talking to Boo Jones. He wasn't talking to <laughs> Richard's dad. There was no politics. You know, he wasn't trying to be nice so that, so that your dad would like him, you know, no, he was talking to the, your dad's Buddha nature directly. And the, the girls too, the, yeah. the, his, were they, they were his girlfriends or future wives or, <laughs> no, my father. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He didn't take drugs. But he he loved his woman, and he he loved up, Yeah, he he showed up with two women, one on each arm. Gopal was just always loved that. Gopal laughed so hard when he yeah, saw that. That's, but, yeah, that's that's your dad, and and Shurfu talked to them. That was the thing. Was I was so impressed because he's. I mean, it's just boom. He's he takes you on now. You know, it, the chance to meet a sage and to be taught by a sage. How, you know, the fact that your dad had that connection with him, my mother, too. He sure would talk directly to my mother, just as if she were, you know, a living being on her way to Buddhahood. And and it was really, you know, I saw that. Anyway, so go ahead. I interrupted you. No, you didn't interrupt. Uh, I'm glad you elaborated on it. I didn't realize you translated. Yeah. But but uh, and I like what you said about uh, Shifu talking to my father directly. And that actually brings me to another great thing about cultivating at Gold Mountain. It didn't matter how great a cultivator you were or how hard you studied or what, if you got a PhD in Buddhism or you were another master, 
or you were somebody like I always loved Roha, how she showed up every day with the flowers for the altar, and so many of the Chinese community that would come in later on and always bring some kind of food or something, and and just sometimes they would bring toothpaste, soap, but it didn't matter who you were. People even off the street, surfer would spend time and they'd just sit down and talk to them, you know, and uh, yeah. have a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. So this was the way, it was an openness at Gold Mountain and an austere, it was very austere. You know, we had the whole afternoon and I think it was four or five that meditation began before the mm -hmm. sutra lectures, right? Yep, before Wan Ku. Wan Ku was 6.30. So the sit was, was it five? What was it? It was one hour. And so I think it ended at 15. So it was 5.15 to 6.15. Then you had 15 minutes before one cook. Yeah, right. And then uh, we, we bring Sherfu down. That was always a great ceremony. You know, I, I remember going upstairs and bringing him down. And yeah. Hung Wan and I, for years, were one on each side of him because we both fell asleep in suture lectures. Hung Wan was the first to fall asleep, and then he started sta standing up. Hung yep. Wan started standing up. Yep. And then one, were you there at the time that I was, I was also in the front of the line on the opposite side of Hung Wan, and one day I was just not nodded out. And then Shurfu, I didn't know it, but from the high seat, Shurfu made his hand into a gun and shot me, and all of a sudden I went up like this. Oh, no, I didn't know that. That's really when good. I, when I came out of the sleep, everybody in the hall was laughing, and I didn't know <laughs> why. And then Shurku said to me, well, well, where were you? And I said, I was in Paisley land, you know? Paisley and, land. Yeah. And then everybody had a, a hard time translating that for Shurku because Shurku would say, what's Paisley land, you know? <laughs> Guahang. Hey, Guahang, what's Paisley land? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... At that time, Hong Jing and, uh, and Hong Cho were there also. Okay. So after so that, let, let me ask. Hold on. Keep keep your uh, hold that thought. Um, you so you didn't have any contact with the trio of Hong Jing, uh, Hong Cho, Wahu, and uh, Hong Qian, right? You those three. Were, did you did you connect with them at all? Major with Hong Ching and Hong Shou. Oh, you did. Okay, because yeah. I came after they let they had gone to Hong Kong when I finally showed up. Uh, uh, so uh, I I want to I want to add to your story. Um, so you know Hung Yo, David Bernstein. Yeah. Hung Yo yeah. was my college roommate, right? In I Michigan. Didn't know that. Yeah, you know I were roommates in Michigan for three years. Then I went. I took in '69. I went to study. Chinese at Donghai University in Taiwan. And uh, when this this was with Oberlin College summer session. So that was over. And they came back home and I went on to Japan. And I in, in the autumn of 69, I found a Zen temple in Japan on Taiji. Oh. I stayed there for three months. But then I found out that my, my father was dying back in Toledo. So I flew back to Toledo and uh, uh, I had one more year of, of co my senior year of college to finish, and I got to to Oakland University in Michigan. And, and Hung Yo had graduated early and gone to San Francisco to become a monk. So, so I came out to Berkeley, and he said, "Oh, phone rings." You know, he says, "Hey," he says, "I, you're in Berkeley." I said, "Yeah." He says, "You need to come over to Gold Mountain. You remember, you used to, we used to, so when we were sitting Zen in our dormitory, Zazen." We used to talk about the patriarch, right? I said, yeah, yeah. He said, where do we say he was? And I said, well, I don't know, the Himalayas or, you know, somewhere, maybe in some cave somewhere. He says, forget all that. He's in he's in the mission district. The abbot is here in San Francisco. Come and meet the abbot. And so I said, yeah, right. I said, yeah, some Hispanic ghetto. Come on, get real. <laughs> I've been to Japan. I know in Zen, you dip your hands in the water. You don't need a cup. You eat pine nuts when you're hungry. He says, you're just all attached to the surface. Come meet the abbot. And I said, nah. <laughs> so I turned him down, right? Meanwhile, uh, Vajrabodhi C was coming in the mail. The little ones, you know? Uh, right. here, here was a picture of Hung Jing. This tall Jewish guy with glasses, 
look, looking like, you know, and I thought, I actually, I took Vajrabodhisi and I threw it across the room, hit the wall, you know, not good, not good. So I, I said, I look, I said, phony, you know, so it's like I had really bad attitude, you know, it was arrogant. So another six months passed and uh, I was cooking for myself, eating brown rice and steamed vegetables every day. And the phone rings and uh, Hung Yo says, OK, he says, you hungry? He says, we've got a uh, this is a Saturday. We're having a big celebration at Gold Mountain. Come on over and eat some veg vegetarian Buddhist food. So I said, oh, OK, you know, so I got in my Volvo. I drove across the Bay Bridge and I parked on 15th Street and I'm looking around, man, here's the projects, you know, it's like, whoa, <laughs> this neighborhood, you know. The police so, wouldn't go into those projects. Oh, That's God. how tough it was. <laughs> so I locked my car door and ran across the, the, the sidewalk, pounded on Gold Mountain's door and it went. And who did I meet? You. <laughs> yeah. You. You opened the door. And you said, what do you want? And I said, is Gold Mountain Monastery hung yo? And you said, come in, you know. <laughs> and my first impression is, well, who's this tall dude, you know, mm -hmm. this tall monk? And uh, immediately, the cold, the first thing that hit me was the cold. And then the next was the, the incense. So first my skin, then my nose. Then I saw the monks and nuns all huddled up, you know, wearing, you know, caps and scarves and hoods and and so and then i heard the sound so every one of my senses you know the skin the nose the eyes the ears and suddenly i had this this feeling of i heard a voice inside and i was i was a jock i was raised playing baseball and you know i wasn't spiritual and i heard this voice that said you're home you're back go to work and it was like what you know, so I went back out onto 15th Street because that was too weird. And I saw the noise and Smitty's body shop. You remember? Yeah. Meow, meow, yeah. Doing the, the lug nuts. Meow, meow, yeah. meow. And then the bus is going by and the planes overhead. And I turned around. I went back in. You opened the door again. And all the tension just drained out of my body, just all the way down to my toes. And it was like. And I, I didn't realize in my heart I had this knot of tension down in the bottom of my heart. I could feel it. And it just went like that. You're back, you're home, go to work. And I didn't see the abbot, but I, I saw you and we had lunch. And then you were, I remember I was walking close to the, you were standing on the stairs under your, your hut underneath the staircase. Right. And you, you said to me, can you recite the great compassion mantra? And I said, oh, what's the great compassion mantra? You said, learn it. <laughs> you, handed, you handed me a copy of the great compassion mantra and i'm like okay, okay. so i i took that and i i kept then uh i didn't see the abbot that whole first visit and uh because he i think he was at washington street or something so anyway i came back in brazil at that time yeah? he wasn't i don't think he was at brazil that might have been it might have been so anyway um uh the, my next call, Hung Yo said, hey, uh, we need a translator. You're, you're learning Chinese, right? I said, well, sort of. And he said, come on over. We need your to, your help. And it was like, more, vege more vegetable food, more vegetarian <laughs> food. Yeah. He said, I'm coming. So <laughs> that was how. So I connect you answering the door with my first step inside Gold Mountain Monastery. That was my first impression. So what, one of the stories... You know, some of the things I think I heard people say, I find out later that I don't think they, that they didn't say, but a story that's etched in my mind that you, that you did say was that at some point you were driving across the bridge to Gold yeah. Mountain, and you had the thought in, my mind, in your mind, this is it. If I go through that door, my life is ended, and I'm entering the monastic life, and wow. it's a it, the, this is in my heart now. If, if if I go through the door at Gold Mountain this time, that's it. And I I I always remember that story because the way you said it was so real. It was like you're leaving this world behind hmm. if you go through that door at Gold Mountain. Now where this came up, I don't know, but. Today I was thinking about it. I'm quite positive I heard it because I remember oh, okay. the story. 
story of the bridge. And I was thinking what a metaphor that is, because the bridge yep. is from one world to the other world, you know, yep. one yep. side to the other side. And I was thinking that that was such a decision, because it uh -huh. was a major decision, a life-changing decision. It was. It was. Oh, see.